coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition. How serious is the problem at the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station? We'll speak with an engineer who helped build the power plant. And San Diego's economic success may lie in its scientific innovation. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. And I'm Peggy Pico in for Dwayne Brown. San Diego Mayor Jerry Sanders says he's about to release his final city budget and it won't be like the others he's released in his term. It will be paperless and for the first time in a long time he says it will be truly balanced. The mayor's office says the spending plan for 2013 will be released on Wednesday. Earlier this year Sanders said the city would end the 2012 fiscal year with a 16 million dollar surplus. Part of that surplus is being applied to next year's budget. The San Diego City Council voted unanimously today to go to the bond market for $75 million to pay for infrastructure repair projects. Let's be really clear about what we're talking about today, particularly for the folks in the audience. We're talking about $30 million for road repairs. We're talking about uh, $8.2 million for sidewalk curb ramps and other uh, ADA uh, amenities, $2.6 million for new street lights, $16 million for facility improvements. Those are libraries, rec centers, uh, city-owned facilities that need some work, $15 million for storm drains. So this is what we're attempting to accomplish today. The staff report was very detailed, but at the end of the day, we're looking to pave a lot of roads, fix a lot of buildings, put out some more street lights, make, up, make some new curb ramps. Mayor Jerry Sanders applauds the decision, saying the city's overall debt will remain in the low to moderate range, even with the bonds. Under the city charter, the debt does not require voter approval. The city has a backlog of about $800 million in capital projects. The San Diego Unified School District may have to take more than a million dollars from its reserves to pay for early childhood education. More than 5,000 students from low-income families are served by the program, and the district says this year enrollment is higher than anticipated. District officials say they will try to get the money from the state. If they do go into the reserve funds, it will be the third time in four years that reserve monies have covered early childhood education. The U.S. Supreme Court will not hear a Poway teacher's appeal to keep banners mentioning God up in his math class. Brad Johnson had kept such banners in his classroom for more than 20 years, but in 2007, the Poway Unified School District asked him to take them down. A Christian legal firm sued on his behalf and won in a lower court. But a federal appeals court reserved that ruling, saying the district did not violate Johnson's freedom of speech by telling him to remove the banners. The Supreme Court's decision not to hear the case leaves the appeals court decision in place. UC San Diego broke ground today on a massive medical complex next to Thornton Hospital in La Jolla. KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg tells us the Jacobs Medical Center will feature three new hospitals. The new 10-story complex will include a hospital for cancer care, one for women and infants, and another for advanced surgery. The center will have 14 operating rooms and 245 beds. Los Angeles-based architect Carlos Amato designed the complex. He says patient input was critical in helping him come up with a unique design. The minute you walk into the building, um, it has a very um, hospitality-like atmosphere. And... Um, you're not going to be uh, exposed to the traditional hospital uh, clinical, heavy on clinical uh, uh, elements uh, that you see uh, all over town. San Diego philanthropists Joan and Irwin Jacobs gave $75 million to the project. Irwin Jacobs says the center will serve as a new training hospital for the region. And I think combining that with all the research that goes on on this Mesa, bringing that to the clinical use much more rapidly. I think all of that's going to have a major impact on our medicine here. The Jacobs Medical Center is scheduled to be finished by June 2016. UC San Diego officials say the first patients will be treated in December of that year. In full disclosure, we want to let you know that Joan and Erwin Jacobs are supporters of KPBS. That story from health reporter Kenny Goldberg. Today's groundbreaking was part of a scientific building boom. We'll have a look at that a little later. The San Onofre nuclear power plant remains shut down as crews try to determine what's causing unexpected wear and tear on some of the tubes and steam generators. Joanne has more from the roundtable.
Government officials are assuring the public the San Onofre nuclear power plant will remain closed until it's safe to reopen. The power plant, which borders San Diego and Orange Counties, have been has been closed for the past two months. Now critics are calling for the permanent closure of the plant. Here's a look at an ad that recently began airing. A nuclear crisis, a defective tube ruptures, leaking radiation, causing an emergency reactor shutdown. But it's not Fukushima, Japan. It's the San Onofre nuclear reactor site near the homes of 8 million Californians. So why is Southern California Edison trying to reopen the plant, covering up evidence of more reactor defects? Profits? Demand that the safety of your family come first. Keep the San Onofre nuclear reactors shut down. Last Friday, the head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, along with Senator Dianne Feinstein and Congressman Darrell Issa, toured the plant. At issue still is why several tubes inside one of the steam generators are wearing at an accelerated pace. Joining me is Dr. Murray Jennix, professor at SDSU School of Business and former engineer at San Onofre. Thank you for being here. Oh, good to be here. Now, uh, I say former engineer, but you actually helped build San Onofre back yes. in the early 80s. So yes, you know I, this plant well. I know it very well. So how significant was this visit then by the head of the NRC? Well, it was significant in that they really haven't come there before, but they came here because of Fukushima last year and public concern. Uh, I don't think that his visit had anything to do with fixing the problem so much because, quite frankly, he isn't going to, but it was for public perception and to make sure that everybody understood how important this issue was. So do you think, from your vantage point, the gravity of what we are seeing as the problem really warranted a visit by the head of NRC, or was it more just the public outcry? I think it was more just a public outcry. Uh, this is an unusual problem, but it's not one that we haven't had before in, in the industry. Well, actually, though, r according to some reports, it is one that hasn't happened before in terms of the degree of wear this quickly. The degree, yes, but the issue, no. Uh, the degree is faster than expected. And to be honest, this is a brand new steam generator. It comes from Japan. We haven't used this manufacturer before, so there are some questions there. But as far as uh, a problem with vibrating U-tubes, this is not a, a new problem. That's why we do understand basically what's wrong. We just don't don't can't pin it down to one specific cause yet. So, although there was a report uh, by commissioned by actually the same group that yeah. produced that ad that we just saw, um, and according to that report, the claim is that San Onofre actually made some changes to this plant to the to the steam generator without going through all of the protocols, the NRC protocols, and that perhaps that has led to accelerated wear. Do you buy that? No, I, I really don't. And the reason I don't buy this is I was the engineer that actually created the training on how to do these design change evaluations back in the mid-80s. Uh, this came about after Three Mile Island because that was a concern from that uh, accident. So we do do, a, uh, well, Southern Cal Edison did a very thorough review from a safety analysis to show that they hadn't changed anything that would impact the safety analysis report. So they did design changes, but they were allowed under the terms of their license and under the terms of the rules put out by the NRC. So from that standpoint, they did exactly what they needed to. And that report does go to the NRC, who does review it. So the NRC does see this and understand how they evaluated this change. And if they have a problem, they would have come back and said so. So why do you think they're wearing so quickly? Well, I think they're wearing quickly because, again, it is a new manufacturer. It's a manufacturer that hasn't provided them to the U.S. before. I think there's a difference between how they designed the models they used to design the steam generator and how flow is actually being put through that steam generator. Do you think the plant needs to be shut down right now? No. Uh, well, shut down until they understand the problem, but then I think it should be restarted once the problem is identified and, and the cause corrected. Now, last time you were on this show, it was shortly after the plant was shut down, a couple of months ago, and you estimated that they would be losing about a million dollars a day because of energy that they're not able to produce. Right. Sixty days later, well, still a million bucks a day? It's a million a day for replacement power. That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, Southern Cal Edison is losing that money. Um, they lose any profit they would have gotten from producing power at San Onofre. But they're not losing the money because they don't have to pay for it out of their pocket. That's, again, coming from the, the rate, uh, the people who use electricity. They pay through their rates for that power. So it's not really a case of uh, Southern Cal Edison losing a lot of money. They're losing the profit of that yes. million dollars. Yes. Do we know how much that is? That I don't know. Um, well, 
I can't. I'd be speculation at this point. Ballpark figure? Um, maybe 10% of that number. So moving forward into the summer, we're hearing now that there could be rolling brownouts. Do you expect that this is power that's about 20% of the power we get here in San Diego County? Do you expect that to be the case? Well, it's 20% of the power we get here, but during the peak summertime hour, this is about 8% of the power. How? Uh, 80? 8%. 8%. 8%. Yeah. Okay. So it's a, a smaller percentage. Still, we don't have as much reserve. That's more than our rolling reserves are. So there could be brownouts if we don't plan ahead. And this is one of the things that the PUC has to do and the ISO. In particular, they need to start setting up uh, contingency contracts. What happened back in 2001 is we had a lot of market manipulation. But we don't want that to happen again. I think there is enough power out there if we start planning now and arrange to get it into San Diego. Okay, Dr. Murray Jennings, thanks for being here. Well, thank you. Ordinary San Diegans are using extraordinary talent to cope with mental illness. They're doing it through music, art, and much more. We'll introduce you to a few of those folks in just the moment. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS, at 8, Antiques Roadshow returns to El Paso to discuss the styles and construction that distinguish Texas spurs and what collectors are willing to pay for them. Then at 9 on the first of two new episodes, San Diego's Historic Places explores how San Diegans connect to the region's past through living in historic homes. And at 9.30 in the second episode, see how World War II changed San Diego and San Diegans. That's tonight on KPBS. Tuesday nights at 10, only on KPBS. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by A new art project based in San Diego profiles ordinary people who use their extraordinary talents to cope with mental illness. I met with a few of the participants willing to share their unique stories. Nancy Fuller is a successful businesswoman. She was in her 50s when she rode her first motorcycle. The reason behind her midlife pavement pounding is as daring as her routine ride in the Alpine Hills. And as the medication was starting to work, I thought, I got to fight this. So I'm going to do something that really scares the heck out of me. And <laughs> the biggest thing I could come up with was learning to ride a motorcycle. Her road therapy, along with medication and psychological support, helps Nancy live with major depression. I didn't really get a diagnosis till I was in my 50s. Till one day, literally, I couldn't get out of bed and I couldn't stop crying. And my husband said, we, you need to get some help. And that's what I did. Nancy's story of living with mental illness is part of a new San Diego-based art project called Chronicles of the Ordinary, or CODO. CODO is a collection of photographs and stories of people that have mental illness. The project is very personal for co-founders Wendy McNeil and photographer Victoria Madoff. Yeah, very charismatic. The CODO project came about when I had a, uh, a, a close family member of mine had a mental health crisis and I was trying to cope with the stress of it and wanting to control it and fix it and photography is very meditative for me and so I thought you know I will 
look for other people with mental illness and photograph them. Um, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in uh, 1990. So I was in the hospital for a manic episode probably once a year for about 10 years till I broke the cycle. More than a decade later, medication, psychotherapy, a good job and happy marriage makes Wendy a recovery role model. And I really wanted to capture the voice of people that have mental illness. Psycho man mind must be discouraged. Grab a new courage to blab the blurb of words heard by the cursive worsening person of the earth. Another thing certain, we're uncertain of our worth. Voices like that of musician and rapper Eric Goldman. Scooping up just spoonful of this covert dessert. Goldman performs in a mellow trip hip hop beat from his latest CD, Newfound Way. This Newfound Way definitely does, you know, and uh, it talks about kind of making your way as, as someone with, with illness or madness. Richard, it's time to take a new pledge. Raw lyrics reveal details of Eric's 15-year debilitating illness that includes depression, schizoaffective, and dissociative disorders. You know, paranoia, uh, delusional thinking, thinking that people are after you or watching you, and um, hearing voices. I did hear voices at one time. They've, they've largely gone away often replaced with his musical voice and now his story in the Chronicles of the Ordinary. It's kind of an ironic title because it's, it's really, you know, the ordinary, but it's really of the extraordinary. They, they kind of focus on our extraordinary natures. That's just one of the core messages of the Kodo Project, says Wendy McNeil. Part of this is about empowering people that have mental illness to really have them recognize that their narratives are important and their stories are powerful and that people can connect to them, um, whether they have a mental illness or not. In other words, I think this definitely is a stigma buster. Stigma Nancy Fuller overcame, not only for herself, but also for her 17-year-old son when he was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. At times he can see things that aren't there, hallucinations, delusions. Regardless of the diagnosis, she recommends everyone learn how to ease the bumpy ride on the road of mental illness. It could be somebody in our own family, a friend, and we need to know how to help somebody, how to be a friend, how to reach out to them, and to realize it's just like any other illness. To find out more about the Chronicles of the Ordinary and for links to mental health services in San Diego, go to our website, kpbs.org. While many sectors of the economy remain sluggish, there is a bright spot in San Diego's biotech industry. Joanne has more at the Evening Edition Roundtable. After years of an economic slowdown, could science be leading San Diego into a boom? According to a story on the front page of the paper today, nine development projects are in various phases of construction. Here to talk about his front page UT San Diego article is reporter Gary Robbins and Joe Panetta, president and CEO of Biocom. Biocom represents more than 600 life science organizations in San Diego and throughout Southern California. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Right, thank you. So, Gary, let's begin with some of these projects. Just give us a snapshot of some of the bigger ones? Well, they cover a variety of areas. The more, most of them are about biomedical research, doing things that are trying to go from bench to bedside, developing a discovery and getting it to market to help people. But there are also, uh, there's also a major new engineering building at the Jacobs School of Engineering, which continues to grow. There are a couple of buildings that are uh, going to be on the cliffs there at Scripps that have to do with studying the state of the ocean and what the ocean contributes to the climate. And there's a new planetarium that's just about to open at Palomar College, which in its own way may be more visible to the public because the original planetarium is where most people in San Diego learned about the cosmos over the decades. So it covers a wide spectrum, but it's primarily biomedical research. Now, we have a fairly sluggish, sluggish economy still. What's, what's driving this then? Well, the biotech economy has actually been growing over time, even with the sluggishness in the economy. In fact, in 2010, uh, we saw about a 5% increase in employment in the, in the life science industry here in Southern California. So there's uh, a, a need, obviously, to continue to develop new medicines. And uh, we've, we've got these incredibly efficient new technologies and sequencing and, and other areas that are allowing us to, uh, to test products and develop products in a much more efficient way and a, and a faster way. 
Now, Gary, some of these are, are public institutions. Do we know uh, where the money's coming from in terms of this development? Most of it comes from bonds that are approved by voters during initiatives. So if you just look back at the, the major elections, most of the time there are bonds on there to approve roads, schools, research institutions. So the UC has a lot of those, and these are mostly bond initiatives that were approved years ago. You mentioned Qualcomm, too. Do we see more of these private-public um, sort of partnerships that are funding some of this? Absolutely. In fact, in San Diego, we're seeing a lot of these public-private partnerships. If you look at the Sanford Burnham Consortium for Regenerative Medicine, as an example, uh, the uh, the West, uh, I think it was called the West Wireless Institute. I think they've changed their names, name, but talk about Qualcomm, uh, this convergence of technologies that's taking place between telecommunications and medical devices and life science. So uh, there is a lot of public-private partnership going on. Now, Gary, your article points to one of these development projects called a Translational Research Institute. Institute. Tell me more about what that means. Well, that's going to be built next to the Moore's Cancer Center uh, up off the five uh, at the UC uh, San Diego facility. The basic idea there is to put more cancer researchers in this big new building. It's a 300,000 square building, which is very large. But at the same time, bring in private industry, private investigators. So you have people doing the basic applied research, and you have industry, which is good at taking discovery and turning it into something, translating that into new drugs, into new medical devices. So clinical and translational medicine. Isn't that sort of what's new, too? I mean, it, I think for a long time we thought of research at the bench. It kind of stayed there for a very long time, and scientists weren't so good at marketing their discoveries. Is this really what San Diego is getting good at or what, in general, science is, is now getting better at? Well, I, I think San Diego, of course, is always at the forefront of what's happening in, in the evolution of the life science industry. So we are seeing a lot more happening here in the way of translating early-stage research. Uh, research in, into a, an opportunity to turn it into products and companies, and you know, there, are, there are probably half a dozen efforts underway here in San Diego right now to create those kinds of facilities. Uh, Merck recently announced a translational research facility that uh, uh, will probably occupy, I, I think, about 100,000 square feet or so. Uh, we're seeing it even at the UC San Diego Medical School where there's a translational aspect to, to what they're doing in teaching physicians and, and physician researchers as well. We often hear so much that San Diego has to really, you know, not, not necessarily just expand its economy but really diversify because we had relied so much on the military and we saw what happened in mm -hmm. the early 90s with that. Um, is this sort of the, the, the new um, the new? Th I, I want to say that the new business, the new industry that we're going to have to kind of all get together and say this is our future? Well, this industry employs about 41,000 people here, here in San Diego, and it continues to grow. The diversity that we're seeing is both in the translational field but also in new areas of, of life science, uh, algae biofuels and other, other mm -hmm. forms of biofuels. Uh, the industrial biotechnology area, uh, which, which I like to call green chemicals, is a, a whole new phase that could actually dwarf the whole pharmaceutical side of the industry with all the opportunity that exists there. And we've got companies doing that here as well. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Joe Panetta and Gary Robbins in your story. Of course, it's the front page of the UT today if people want to read more about this. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks. Should a Marine be able to say whatever he wants on Facebook? Some of your thoughts coming up in our public square. This is KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next news hour, President Obama meets with Brazil's leader to try to strengthen an often frayed relationship. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. I'm Yul Kwan from the new PBS series, America Revealed. Make Wednesdays your destination for exploration. First, dive into an ocean full of giants on nature. Next, Nova takes us inside the deadliest tornadoes on Earth. Then, join me for the premiere of America Revealed and see how we plant, grow, and harvest enough to feed a hungry nation. This Wednesday, PBS is your destination for exploration. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you.
Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. As you heard earlier, there is no word on how long the San Onofre nuclear power plant will remain closed, leaving questions about rolling brownouts this summer. Val Sanfilippo writes, with San Onofre off, this would be a good opportunity to accelerate the solar roof program by having SDG&E install solar roofs for all and then lease them to the ratepayers. And on another story we told you about last week, Sergeant Gary Stein, the so-called anti-Obama Marine, he was posting negative comments about President Obama on his Facebook. A U.S. Marine Administrative Board recommended Stein be dismissed with an other-than-honorable discharge. Dan Jacobs in Mira Mesa had this to say, The president is commander-in-chief and, as such, is like the CEO of the military. If an employee of a corporation posted comments to the Internet urging other employees to disregard directors from the CEO, like Stein, that employee would also likely be fired. Well, the final decision now rests with the commanding general of Marine Corps Recruit Depot San Diego. We'll keep you posted. Well, you can weigh in on this conversation by following us on Twitter. Of course, you can like us on Facebook, or you can always send me an email directly, jferian at kpbs.org. And now let's go back to the news desk where Peggy has a recap of tonight's top stories. On Wednesday, San Diego Mayor Jerry Sanders will release his final city budget. He says it's the first truly balanced budget the city has had in years. And San Diego Unified may have to tap into reserve funds to pay for early childhood education. It would be the third time in four years that the reserves were used for the program, which serves low-income families. Also today, UC San Diego broke ground on the new Jacobs Medical Center. It will feature three hospitals, one for cancer care, one for women and children, and one for surgery. The center is expected to open in 2016. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening, and we leave you with a look at the forecast.